shaved head with the sari kurta and distributing the prasad, chanting Hare Krishna on the street. And I thought in my mind, who have changed these people? So I asked some devotees, who is your guru and how you have came to Hare Krishna? They said, our guru is a Prabhupada and he is coming after one month. Then after that I asked the rice gross people in the office, ah, these people are chanting Hare Krishna and who are they? They are taking drug and they are chanting Hare Krishna. So I, I decided that we go to stay in the temple. So I stayed two nights there. I saw early morning they wake up at 3 o'clock, cold shower they take and the arti and sing Hare Krishna mantra. Who have changed these people? So I decided to meet Prabhupada. Suddenly I have some business in Fiji, so I came back. Prabhupada came to Melbourne. And then I met Prabhupada in temple and asked Prabhupada, when Prabhupada going to Hawaii. And then Rani asked, can you tell me also the flight number? So Prabhupada told the boy, tell them the flight number. So Nandrani got the flight number and Nandrani rang to us in Fiji. So Prabhupada's flight is staying half an hour. Literally 2,000 people came to really? greet Prabhupada. We had advertising uh, papers and radio. So when the flight came there, the jumbo jet, when I saw Prabhupada, I suddenly went to Dundalk Obedicenses. And the uh, first question Prabhupada asked me, is there any Radha Krishna temple here? I said, no, Prabhupada, there is no Radha Krishna temple. There are so many small temples here, but not Radha Krishna temple. So you build nice in Hindi, Bariyasa Mandir, I said, I'll, I'll try my best to build that temple. After 20 minute discussion, I paid voices to Prabhupada. And when I set up, Prabhupada put his head on my head. And I feel just like, oh, my sins have gone now. I began to cry. Prabhupada said, from today, you chant 60 rounds. And from that day, I start chanting. I used to wake up three o'clock and I used to chant 60 rounds every day. There was certain Indian gentlemen who had this honor and respect for Srila Prabhupada. Devotees such as Kartikeya Mahadevya and Mr. Shetty in Bombay. They act like old devotees from previous lifetime. Old Vaishnava that were reigniting their relationship with Srila Prabhupada in this lifetime. The unique position of Deoji, or Vasudeva, as he was initiated, was that he was the CEO of a very large uh, and important company, companies, many companies in Fiji. He was way up there in, in the elite of uh, Indian businessmen. So he owned a, a chain of grocery stores. That was one of the retail businesses they had. And when the devotees were taken through the grocery stores, and we came to the butcher shop, and you know we were aghast, like, ah, how is this possible? And when it was asked of Srila Prabhupada, well, what should uh, we advise Vasudev to do? What, you know, should we tell him that he should close down the butcher shop? And Srila Prabhupada said, no. He doesn't have to close the butcher shop at this time. See, this will come. We were just black and white, cut and dry devotees. We had no nuances in our approach towards Krishna consciousness because we were immature, spiritually immature, even at this so-called late date in our spiritual life, 1975. Prabhupada could understand that Vasudev was in business. The business was well established in the islands for many, many years. And Vasudev had his brothers and uncles and aunts, and his family was well immersed in this business. And for Prabhupada to say, no, you have to close down the butcher shop, that would be a, a point of controversy amongst the family members. Only Vasudev at that time had fully embraced Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada could understand that if Vasudev became strong, if there weren't any preconditions put on his relationship with Srila Prabhupada having to do with his business, then eventually he would win over all his other family members. And as it turned out, most of Vasudeva's family members did you know, embrace Vaishnavism. And some of them actually took initiation. Vasudeva invited him that next time when you pass from Nandi to Hawaii, uh, next time 
next year you come and stay in Delhi. Please stay in Fiji. Prabhu says, I'll write to you when, when I can come. So Prabhu wrote a letter to me. I'm coming in 1975. Did you write from Hawaii? Have you got the land? I said, no. Then I decided I got the land, so I'll donate this land to Esco. Build a nice temple. We gave a contract for $330,000. I didn't have any idea of how to build a temple. When I sent a copy of a plane to Prabhupada in my book, Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, why you build a dome in front? The architect said, front people can see from the Now, dome should be where the ditties are. So we have to make so much alteration for that. And he said the roof should be concrete. For collection, Vasudev used to go early in the morning, 6 o'clock with a PTG in his hand and Prabhupada's photo there. So as they see Prabhupada's photo, someone gives thousand dollars, some five hundred dollars, some two thousand dollars. Within uh, two months, I collected forty thousand dollars. And then we got some loan from them. Thank you. When Prabhupada first came, in the morning he was going for morning walk to Marine Drive in Lotaka. And after coming from Morning work, we had Guru Puj. His first program in Natambua whole Lotoka. Yeah. And the whole hall was full with people. Upstairs, downstairs, two thousand people was there. Prabhupada gave lecture for twenty minutes in English. So Vasudev requested many Indians are here who don't understand English. So can you speak in Hindi? So Prabhupada gave same lecture in Hindi. And then he gave one program in Nandi, Ramakrishna Mission, and one at Va, It was in theatre. I used to go every day to see Prabhupada at about 4 o'clock when I finished my business. And I used to sit down with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada used to tell me about Bhagavad Gita. We used to talk to each other. Once he didn't come, so after lunch and rest, he rang to call Vasudev. Then we were sitting in the veranda. And uh, one devotee was there, Sajjan Ashram. He asked Prabhupada, the local people say that Kaliya is here in Fiji. And Prabhupada asked, are there any wild creatures here, like wild lion and serpents? And he said, no. Then he said, then Kaliya must be maybe here. And after that, he changed uh, to make uh, Krishna Kaliya. Some of the Hindus had said that this is uh, Kaliya who has come to Fiji when he was banished from the waters of the Jamuna, and that this big snake was living up in a big lake up on the top of a mountain where nobody went. And in Fiji, there's no snakes. So they told Prabhupada that. And Prabhupada said, yes. He said, then it is possible because where there's the big snake, there's no small snakes. Because the big snake will eat the small snakes. So one devotee, he took up the challenge to go to this lake. According to the superstition, if you went to this lake, you wouldn't come back or you would become insane. But not many people know how to get there. So he had to get a guide. And so we paid this guide some money. And he was a little bit reluctant, but finally he agreed. So they started to hike up there and a big storm came up. Big typhoon. Winds were blowing. Trees were <laughs> knocked over. So the guy became spooked. And he said, no, no, this is the sign. We're not supposed to go. So he abandoned him. So the devotee thought, well, I'm going to do it. So he didn't know how to get there, but he still tried to persevere. But the storm became too violent. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. So because of that folk tale, Vasudev uh, established the Krishna Kaliya temple, and it's a unique deity of Krishna dancing on the head of the Kaliya serpent. Then the next trip, Prabhupada came in 1976. To lay foundation. To lay foundation. Yes. And that time we go to yes. I told Prabhupada, my brother, go on board. We will take initiative. Yes, three. So next day, Prabhupada told Prabhupada, Das, make it ready. The yagna. He asked Prabhupada, I want to take initiation from him. 
said, okay, save your hand. So, I said, we both save hand and we go to the initiation. After initiation, the next morning, Prabhupada called us in his room and gave second initiation next day. Before, Prabhupada said, I am drinking tea, Prabhupada. Uh, from today, you live tea, tomorrow, you drink tea. Then, Prabhupada said, I am chanting uh, other mantra also. This uh, Hare Krishna mantra will cook on that. How will give him initiation? And he presented first uh, mana to Vasudeva Prabhu, then to me, and then to Bhuvan. Upendra went to Fiji first, about a month before I arrived. And I believe it was September 1970. Uh, we were in Suva. People used to call us Mr. and Mrs. Swamiji, which we thought was very funny at that time, you know, because we wore our, our yellow dhoti and sari. <laughs> when we were in Fiji, an Indian family had given us a small Lord Nishinidev deity. I still have him. He was always our deity who presided over our center and our preaching there in Fiji. He was the first Nishinidev deity that appeared in our movement. You know, so that was very significant. He was given to us soon after we had arrived there. On Sundays, we had a feast, and our place would be packed with Fijian people and Indian people. So they took very enthusiastically to the feast. Upendra always wrote to Prabhupada about the difficulties that we were running into and the criticisms and one of the sadhus next door wanted to chant Hare Rama first instead of Hare Krishna first. And Prabhupada just, you know, wrote back and said, well, if he insists on chanting Hare Rama first, what is the harm? <laughs> He's still chanting. And part of it was a criticism about the color yellow for our dhotis and saris. And Prabhupada answered back that usually white dhoti and colorful saris are what's worn in India, but when someone's engaged in preaching activities or devotional activities, they may wear yellow, and your life is always involved in preaching activities. So you may put on a white dhoti if you like, if you want, that is fine. <laughs> He was always instructing us every step of the way. Uh, Upendra would write him letters two or three times a month. So he was our guiding force all the way through. <laughs> we really took to heart and felt like we had been given a responsibility to follow Lord Chaitanya's prediction that in every town and village there would be chanting of the Holy so we literally went to every little village that we could and often we're hosted in a very humble place um, ancient temples of uh, Narayan or Kali or whatever but we would hold a program and all the villagers would come there would be simple prasadam then we'd go on to another village and make our rounds. We went to Lotoka. We had met Vasudev's father, who was a very elderly man at that point, and his five sons, of whom Vasudev was one of them. Uh, his father was a very devotional man and was always wanting to help in any way he could. And then we heard later how um, Vasudev had come around to want to know more about Krishna consciousness and follow Prabhupada. And it was very exciting for us to see that uh, from our humble beginnings that Vasudev was going to take up the mission and carry on Krishna consciousness there under Prabhupada's supervision. When we arrived in Fiji, I remember it was practically one o'clock in the morning after our flights from Australia, and it was a codice. Of course, there was no temple then. We were staying at one Indian family's house, and they had prepared prashadam for all of us. And of course, it wasn't codice prashadam. But Prabhupada just said, it's okay. And that was it. So we took prashadam.
shot him. So then we went to bed around 2.30 or 3 o'clock. So then as Prabhupada did everywhere, when the sun was ready to come up, Prabhupada was ready for his morning walk. And that was always the case. It didn't matter how much Prabhupada was traveling, if he stayed in a place for two days or two weeks. As soon as Prabhupada got to the next place, he set his watch and he, he set his body and he just continued on. There was never any question, jet lag. The word didn't exist with Prabhupada. It wasn't something anyone talked about. Prabhupada never exhibited it. We went out on a morning walk and he would walk as quickly as he did everywhere for about an hour to an hour and a half. And then we had a program. Prabhupada always had a morning program and he spoke and then we had Prashadam and then Paramahamsa and I we were just waiting for the opportunity to sleep again because we already had like three hours of sleep and for us that was just really difficult and we were hoping after breakfast Prabhupada would take a nap so I brought Prabhupada his breakfast and when he was finished I came and took everything out and Prabhupada laid down so you know, I went back I said Prabhupada's resting so Parmahams and I, we laid down. Of course, we fell asleep. We were out. And Prabhupada maybe took 15 minutes or something, and he was up. So finally I heard a bell ring. So I went into Prabhupada's room, and it happened a few times where I would literally try to wake up as I was offering obeisances, like exercise my eyes. So Prabhupada couldn't tell that I was sleeping. And I sat up. And as soon as I sat up, he said, why are you sleeping? Like dead men. Everyone's awake. You know, the karmis are all working, but not the devotees. Now they're sleeping. He said, you're sleeping very soundly. Why are you sleeping? And of course, when Prabhupada asked, why were you doing something wrong? I never had a response because whatever you said, he would just take that apart. <laughs> so I just said, oh, Prabhupada, I'm sorry. What about Paramahamsa? Why is he sleeping? He said, call him in here. And he goes in, and immediately Prabhupada says, you're a sannyasi. Your business is to minimize bodily demands, minimize sleeping, minimize eating. He said, why are you sleeping? And Paramahamsa said, oh, Prabhupada, I have jet lag. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. And Prabhupada said, jet lag? <laughs> He said, well, we just flew from here and done this. And Prabhupada said, so? He said, I'm also flying. I'm doing the same thing. I'm awake. And then he said, all right, go on. Go sleep if you want. So go back to the room. And, of course, we wouldn't sleep. And sometimes five minutes would go by or sometimes a half hour and he'd ring the bell again. And he'd go in and then he'd tell you to start reading and 